Hello, this is uh, Robert Griswold. I got a smile on my face because one of my favorite uh, uh, friends is with me and we're um, going to be doing an interview today. But um, uh, Robert Griswold, HeroesNation.tv, owner of ReadyMade Resources. Um, if you go to ReadyMade Resources, you'll see we have thousands and thousands of uh, different products uh, for sale to help you survive the coming days. You know, food, uh, you know, especially um, I'm a big uh, night vision guy. I think, Jamie, you are too. You, you kind of like it a little bit, but but we have all that. Uh, oh. Yeah, there's my my helmet's over my shoulder over here. So, yeah, <laughs> oh, <laughs> same thing. You know, um, if you see my desk right now, I have um, all kinds of radio equipment. Uh, excuse me, but, you know, just different radio equipment. I'm, I'm a radio geek. I admit it. Um, and and so I, I really enjoy that stuff. Now, uh, again, you know, I, I think there's a triad to, to um, preparation. The first and foremost preparation that we have to have is we have to be in with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that is where our power comes from. That, you know, I can have the most beautiful Ferrari in the world, but if there's not a battery in it to start it, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, that is where the deutimus, the power comes from, is our, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I have to surround myself with good men and women. That's why I like Jamie so much, you know, we sharpen each, each iron, um, iron sharpens iron. And so we have to surround ourselves with, with men and women Abraham, when he was going to go rescue Lot, surrounded himself by, I think, 318 men. These were men trained in the art of war, men trained in the art of survival. They were tough men. It was 175 miles from where Abraham was to go rescue his nephew Lot. And that wasn't like, you know, walking down the streets of uh, the Wizard of Oz, the Yellow Brick Road. That was Judean wilderness, desert, high temperatures, barren. And so these were hard men. And um, today, uh, I, I see is my my triad of preparation. I want to surround myself by men who say, Bob, you're in the race. Come on. Even when I'm when discouraged, you know, and I then vice versa, when they're discouraged, I can encourage them in the race. Just come on. We'll make it. We'll make it. You know, God's with us and, and encourage one another as we see that day approach, which is biblical. And then the third thing uh, that I do at Ready Made Resources is uh, sell the preparation gear. It's the least important. Um, it, it, I think it is important, but it is the least important. Um, but if you are interested in that, you can go to readymaderesources.com or call me at 800-627-3809. Without any more ado, I want to introduce Jamie. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him a question here uh, because it's going <laughs> to tie into the, the program. So Jamie's a former Marine, uh, jarhead, leatherneck, you know, um, you know, war veteran. Um, he's, 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 he's seen the, the ugly face of war. Um, Jamie, what would happen? Uh, the couple scenarios. So first of all, you get out of boot camp, you go to your uh, wherever your duty station is, and there's no NCOs. What would happen if you were in Iraq and there were no NCOs? There was nothing. You were left to yourself without any thought that you know, no, nobody's coming. I don't have any bosses. I don't have this. I don't. I don't have that. What would happen? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there's there's the old axiom, you know, our moniker when the when the cat's away, the mice will play. And it's it's no different in the natural, you know, whether it's in a corporate environment, whether it's in a fam familial environment, whether it's teenagers without, you know, uh, a good, healthy parental oversight or whether it's Marine Corps infantry war fighters, you know, when left to our own devices. I, you asked me this when we were off air and I said, uh, yeah, what we would do wouldn't be family friendly conversation when we were left to ourselves. A bunch of 18 to 22 year old guys, you know, uh, that are basically told that they're invincible and they're God's gift to humanity, which is what they tell you in the Marine Corps and, and, and then left to yourselves. Right. So it, it doesn't go well. And I think, you know, contained within that, uh, Robert is, there's just so many rich biblical principles, even as you were doing your intro, you know, and sharing with people about ready-made resources and the and the nature of what authentic practical preparedness looks like. Uh, there's just, there is such a disconnect. And by the way, for people that don't know, you know, I won't go into the details of, of Robert's pedigree and his background. I know he considers it all lost compared to knowing Christ and being unified with him. But Robert's no slouch. He was operating in levels and with agencies that most people can't even uh, comprehend. They don't have the paradigm for it in, in uh, uh, very non-permissive environments all over the world. That's how he got in the preparedness business. And then same thing with me, with my background, my quote unquote pedigree, which again, consider it as garbage compared to, compared to knowing Christ and be unified with them. 
But we know having been in those in that reality and now being on this side of the reality with the with the true and better reality, the kingdom mindset and internal perspective, that all the practical preparedness in the world is nothing compared to walking intimately with your king and in communion with the Lord God most high through his son Jesus Christ. And it's like, you know, I've been traveling the country. I actually have trained out there at Robert's property. I've trained a bunch of guys out there, been out there and done training myself, been out there and trained other people as a cadre. And, and, uh, and I say the same thing every time is like, dude, your preparedness means nothing if you don't have a knowing of your God. If you aren't so intimately in tune to him and his spirit and so disciplined in the Lord, all your practical preparedness means nothing. I mean, I don't know how many thousands of people I've trained around the country in the last three years, going to state to state to state, training whole churches, training whatever, and family emergency preparedness. And I say the same thing. I don't care if you never purchase a single preparedness item, but you have a knowing of your God. I don't care if you're elderly and infirm. I don't care if your body's broke down and you're sick and weary. I don't care if you're highly undereducated or maybe you feel like you have very little to offer, you know, in the physical or in the mental or whatever the capacity is. When you know your God, you are an unstoppable powerhouse and the powers of darkness shriek in horror and the kingdom of God and all the heavenly hosts rejoice over you. So it is the centrality to the, to the, to the narrative. It's the centrality to how we navigate uh, this hostile territory as ambassadors of a kingdom that cannot be shaken right smack through the fog of war. Yeah. You know, um, I, I showed you uh, these earlier and I, I'm a guy, I'm a tech guy. I mean, I'm a gear guy. I, I really do like them. I like going out at night, hiking and all that, but I can promise you, you can have all those you want and, 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 and in hell, you're not going to be thinking I had two pair of night vision. I promise you that. You're not going to be thinking that. You're going to be thinking, I didn't do business with the most high God. I rejected the most high God and, and didn't do that. And I and the, and the point I'm trying to make by asking those earlier questions, the same thing, you know, in, in work. <clears throat> you know, I've been in work environments where the boss is not there. Uh, he doesn't have uh, a good operational knowledge of what's going on in his office. He's out doing his thing, playing golf or, or whatever. And and the, the business suffers. Uh, the same thing in our personal lives. If if, if we don't have a personal accountability, um, you know, a lot of times our personal lives suffer. And the Bible tells us this exact same thing. And I want you to comment on this. You know, that if we don't think the master is going to return soon, um, basically the Bible says, you know, the parties begin, the beer, the women, the, the immoral lifestyle. And that juxtaposed upon the church today, Jamie, where we see such great immorality. I, I just saw a former music leader renounce his Christianity and marry marry his boyfriend. Um, oh, of course. And yeah, and how does not having the hope of your master return affect your day to day operational life as a Christian? Yeah, that's a good question, a loaded question. It, it's it's interesting. I mean, only the Holy Spirit could do this, but it's it's what I just preached on on Sunday at our little house church here, a little church plant in Colorado. And it was all centered on the centrality of hope. And when we look at it, especially in the paradigm, not the paradigm, the reality, the only true reality of our walk from the fall to the, to the redemption and to the eventual restoration, uh, of a right relationship with the Lord is, is it is all centered on, on hope. And it's, it's a hope that will not disappoint. It's a hope that sure. It's a hope that, that is immovable. It, you can be confident in it. It's not a wish. I always make that distinction with believers. Hope in the Lord is not a wish. Wishing is for the pagans, right? A hope in the Lord is so secure. It's so steadfast because the right hand of the father, the seat at the right hand of the father is currently reoccupied as Philippians Philippians one says, you have been bought into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through an inheritance being kept in heaven for you, spotless, unspoiled, and unfading, and you're going to be guarded to it by God's power. So it says to, through, and unto these things. It is a living hope. It is such a clear distinction that separates Christ Jesus <clears throat> and our hope in Christ from everything else. And when we look at it empirically, even from a secular humanistic 
mindset, even a secular psychology mindset, the same thing holds true every time. We were talking about this off air, the, the true and better survival mindset, right? And the survival world and the preparedness community, uh, it doesn't matter if you're if if it's longitudinal studies on shipwreck survivors or concentration camp victims or military personnel, people who have been EPWs, enemy prisoners of war, or or, or POWs, prisoners of war. Uh, they say the same thing that the rules of three in survival actually has a precursor component that everything is based upon. For those of you that don't know, uh, the rules of three in the survival community are or um you know it's it's 3 minutes without air you're dead right 3 days without water you're dead 3 weeks without food and you're dead but there is a component to that that always gets skipped over by by the i don't know nominal you know survivalist or prepper like community is the 3 second rule not the 3 second rule where you can eat something off the floor but the the highly consequential 3 second rule and it says 3 seconds without hope and you are dead. See, hope is actually the centrality of all of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, it says, once you were a people without hope, right? It speaks to this in Hebrews. You had no hope. Now in Christ Jesus, by the propitiation of your sins through Christ, you do have a hope. Once you had none, you were an enemy of God. You were subject to the wrath of God. You were a son of disobedience. You were a son of the devil, right? There's all these distinctions and sonship listed throughout scripture, but now you do have a hope. And it says over and over again, over and over again, this hope will not disappoint. But here's what I think you were alluding to, Robert, is that the indicators will say the algorithm, the 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 cosmic algorithm algorithm are indicators of if your hope is authentic or if you have a false, faulty, corrupted, deceptive hope is an eager anticipation. This is biblically oriented an eager anticipation and a joy. It says, knowing this, you are an eager anticipation. Even all of creation itself, Romans 8, is an eager anticipation of the coming of Jesus Christ for the sons of glory to be revealed. And it says, and in this you hope, and in this hope, you are saved. So your eager anticipation is representative that you have an authentic hope. So coming back again to Philippians 1, it also says, in this living hope you've been bought into, it's a hope that's secure. And it says, and because you have this hope, you are filled with a joy that is inexpressible, and you therefore are achieving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So there's these two indicators, eager anticipation, waiting, looking, waiting, looking, watching, waiting, looking, watching, hypervigilance for your king, hypervigilance for your NCO to show up, right? To show up un unannounced. And it's not just anticipation. It's not just waiting. There's a posture, a distinction of posture that's attached to it. It is an eager anticipation and a joy that is inexpressible. And I ask this every time I talk about Philippians 1. When's the last time you had a joy that was inexpressible? Like so radical that you're like, oh, I didn't know what to say. I don't even know what to say. And yet it says in Christ, this is you hope you have the hope that you have. So when we look at it, Robert, from the true and better survival mindset, surviving this hostile territory, surviving a whole world that lies in the evil one, surviving a whole world that is that lies in the hands of the father of all lies, where everything's a lie, everything's a deception, a land where Jesus said, when I return, will I even find faith in the land? If I don't shorten the days, there'd be no flesh left alive or no flesh that could receive salvation, right? A, a hostile territory that is so gnarly that he says many will abandon in the faith. Many, 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 many will abandon in the faith. They will devote themselves to the doctrines of demons. They won't tolerate sound doctrine. The way of truth will come into disrepute. In this same world, this same battlefield, this, this savage battlefield, it talks about those whose hope is secure in the Lord – because they know their hope, because their hope is in Jesus, not in themselves, not in humanity, not in humanism, not in their finances, and definitely not in their preparedness, but their hope is in the Lord alone, that they will be among those who renew the, their strength and they go out on wings like an evil. Those whose 
hope is in the Lord shall renew their strength. Psalm 33, no king is saved by the side of his army. No great warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him and whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death, to keep them alive in famine. And it's like this, this true and better survival mindset of our age and our generation is centered on and, and symbiotic to and completely uh, immovable from a hope in Jesus Christ. Robert? Sorry, I get spun up, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm glad. To, I'm glad. I like it when you get spun up, Jamie. Um, you know, uh, again, we see the evidence of no hope throughout our nation today. You know, I was just watching. Um, I was on YouTube and I was watching Kensington Street down in Philadelphia, and it is just filled with people, you know, that have no hope, uh, drugs, crime, and we see these homeless communities developing. People that are turning themselves over to drugs, to sex, to anything, trying to find something to stimulate and to satisfy that inner man. And it's only the Lord Jesus Christ that does this. So this is this is the thing that even my brothers and sisters today, we see them falling by the wayside. Jamie, why is it? You know, well, I'm going to just back up a little bit. You know, I, I before the program, we were talking, and I remember when I betrothed Roxanne, you know, it was um, um, February fourteenth uh, of, of you know I betrothed her, and we set a a, a wedding date of June thirteenth. We wanted to make it quick, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, but we had a calendar doing a countdown. You know, I, we were so looking forward to that day when we would be betrothed and we would be wedded. And I remember the night we we were wedded. We just looked at each other and realized that there'd been this divine move in both of our hearts that God had knit us together as one flesh. It was so powerful. I mean, it's just as a man, you know, knowing that I had a woman that loved me and she knows she had a, a man that protected her. And, and that is a perfect representation of what our, a believer's attitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be, that we have such longing anticipation. It's almost like we do a countdown, Lord. Come, come, Lord Jesus, come. And when we have that passion burning in our heart, you know, it has all sorts of good effects on our life. Our whole way we look at everything changes. The way we look at people, the way we look at finance, the way we look at this world changes dramatically because our perspective then turns heavenly. You know, I, I remember reading uh, The Saints Everlasting Rest by Richard Baxter, and he said, you know, there are many, many that stand at that gate, heaven's gate, and they, they, they're standing outside the gate looking in. They see the glory. They see the saints. They see the music. But, Jamie, they never cross over. They never walk through that gate. And then one day they die, and they realize they spent their entire life at the gate of heaven, but never having gone into it. You know, I think, think of the, 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 the ten virgins. Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. Do you think the foolish ones, answer this, do you think the foolish ones realized they were foolish? Oh, no, no. I mean, that's the nature of deception, right? You you can't even conceive it, even when all the objective empirical, empirical data is put right in your face. Even if somebody tells you plainly with perfection of truth and perfection of love at the same time, they can't receive it. And even when you look at it biblically, the key component of the spirit of the end of the age among Christians, which would be half of the virgins, right? Ten virgins. So they're they're all unified. They're all wearing the same uniforms, right? They they all have the same objective. But five of them were so deceived that they couldn't even concede that they were deceived. Hence the nature of deception. And the scriptures say that they will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will allow the way of truth to come into disrepute, and they will always be learning but never come to an understanding of the truth. They will study everything about God. They will study everything about the end times, everything about current events, everything about spiritual warfare, everything about everything. They will study everything and have the form of godliness but never, never be able to enter into the power of it. And they'll always be learning and never be able to enter into the truth what's, of it. What's so the, it is a sad state of affairs. What's the evidence that, that someone has crossed over into that, that the eternal realm? 
what's the evidence in your life that you look for to say, OK, this this person generally what's the biblical evidence is a better way to put it uh, versus those who just claim it's because I, I know um, I, 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 I know brothers who claim to be brothers in the Lord and their lives have sexual sin in them. They have all kinds of sin and they, they you know, but and I look at it and say, you know what you're risking? You know what's really at stake here? Um, what 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 are the evidence signs to you, and according to the scripture, that someone has made that commitment? So, and the person yeah. I'm asking this question se- is several- so you can you can examine people listening can examine yes. themselves. There's several, and and there are there biblically we're, we're given. I you know I use the word algorithm all the time, but there are a lot of biblical algorithms, mm-hmm. right? Like for example, off the top of my head, I'm th- thinking of Psalm 37, where it's like trust, delight, and commit. Right? Trust in the Lord, dwell on the land, enjoy safe pastures, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord, and then He'll do this. He'll make your righteousness shine like the dawn, and the justice of your cause like the new day sun. Trust, commit, delight, then right? You know, and it's like. It's like in everything with prayer and supplication and Thanksgiving, make your request known before God, then the peace of God. So there's always an if then or this then, this then. There's all these algorithms. And and so when you remove any one component, just like any mathematical equation, you you remove or you corrupt or you taint one one decimal point, the entire equation fails. And it's the same thing with the Lord. So an evidence of a regenerate heart in Christ, you're going to see several things. Uh, uh, primarily is a is death. That's what you would see. You would see the mortification of the flesh. You would see a disgust of sin, a hatred of the flesh, and actually a despising of the world. Uh, you know, there. I think it's Psalm 15 says, who may dwell in your tent, O Lord, and live on your holy mountain, right? And it goes down this litany. And one of the ones is... is um, He's describing who gets to dwell with them. And it says, he who despises a vile man, but honors those who fear the Lord. And it goes, do you despise the world and the things of the world? Or do you love the world and the things of the world? Because anyone who loves the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in them. That's such a clear indicator. And when I talk to Christians, I go, well, claimants of Christianity, I go, that means your relationships. That means your faulty family loyalties. That means your narcissistic, emotionally predatory way of trying to get your love tank filled by everybody else around you. That means your love of validation from a world that hates you. That means your love of validation from your bosses that are using you to profit off of you and have made you a slave to their to their profit margin. You know, like that, like when you understand what it means that at the peeling back the layers to loving the world and the things of the world, you'll know when somebody's in Christ Jesus because though they're they're though they're flesh and their spirit at war, right? We get tripped up all, all the time by our flesh. They would hate it. They would go, this world is not my home. Like it says in Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 11, like people who say such things show that this world is not worthy of them. I don't want anything this world has to offer. Again, my hope, I know what I'm hoping in. I know that it's secure. And I know that one day my hope will come to fruition. And I want that. Nothing here is going to satisfy me. So I think a a mortification of the flesh and a dying to the world is, is primary. Secondarily, you would have an eager anticipation. You would actually be among those, as it says, who speed the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many Christians, Robert, in the mainstream uh, uh, evangelifishton world of America actually want Christ to return? I I think 99.97% do not want Christ to return because they think they have it that good. They don't care about the pedophilia. They don't care about the mutilation of our children. They don't care about the beheading of their brothers and sisters in Yemen and Oman and Syria and in Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, where I where I was not too long ago. They don't care about the perversions and the corruptions. They don't care about the blood-soaked uh uh, tributaries of our water systems with the blood of aborted children. They don't care about anything. They do not care about it. They would never want to speed the coming of our Lord. They are not in eager anticipation of it. They're not waiting, looking, longing 
uh, searching. They're not being guarded to. They're not guarding to. They want nothing to do with the, the return of the Lord. So an eager anticipation is a huge indicator of whether or not your heart is fully regenerate in Christ. And the third one I would say just off the top of my head is hope. And with hope comes joy. It says, in this hope you were saved. We hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Those who hope in the Lord will never be ashamed, right? Uh, those whose hope is in the Lord will never be disappointed. It goes on and on. Those who hope in the Lord, it says they're strong and they're courageous. These are all, all sign er, signifiers of somebody whose hope is rightly placed. Those who hope, those who hope, those who hope. Oh, and by the way, those who hope is in the Lord, they will be filled with a joy that is inexpressible. So when somebody is rejoicing in their suffering, they're counting it all a pure joy. When they face diverse, manifold, multiple trials, they don't see these fiery trials coming against them as if something strange is happening to them because they know that the light and momentary afflictions are achieving in something in them that far outweighs everything else. They do not consider it worthy compared to the glory that they're hoping in that is going to be revealed to them in due time. So they have a fear of the Lord. They have a hatred of the world and the things of the world. They hate the flesh, even their failings of their flesh. And they're filled with a hope and a joy that's inexpressible. You go, that person is in the faith. That person has a testimony that actually testifies to who Christ is in them. Not timidity or fear, but power, love, and a soundness of mind. Man, does that person know their God. And their testimony is bold and radiant and resilient and steadfast. And it's filled with good fruit. And they hold out wisdom and they hold out hope and they hold out, you know, authentic knowledge that leads to life. They hold out these things to the lost and dying world around them. Why? Because Christ is actually in them and working out through them to to the redemption and the restoration of the right relationship with God. So, you know, Jamie, that, I'm that's glad what you I said would that. say is an indicator. Uh, the other day I was out doing something and I met a sister in the Lord. And, you know, she knows I know you're always hoping for the coming of Jesus and I want it too, but. I want to raise my family first. I hear it all the time, Robert. I, I hear that I know, all I know. the time. And I'm thinking just like you, you want to raise your children in a world filled with pedophilia. You want to raise your children in a world filled with disease. You want to raise your children in a world filled with danger. You want to raise your children in a world that, that there's a good chance that they're going to be inducted into the army, Marines or something, and have to go off and kill other people or be killed themselves. You know, you want you want to live in a world where you see just absolutely, you want your children to be raised in a world that they're going to go to an educational system that is going to tell them they can mutilate themselves. And I'm, I didn't say this to her, but this is what's going on in my mind. Right, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and totally. I'm thinking, hasn't anybody ever told you about the coming millennial reign of Christ. You know, I just have some scriptures down here. And, you know, the wolf and the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. Cow and the bear shall graze together. The young shall lie down together, and they shall eat a straw like an ox, a lion eating straw like an ox. Um, the little child will bit his hand in the snake and it won't, hit it, it won't hurt them. And then uh, John, oh my gosh. John is seized his glory. He goes, and I saw the new heaven and new earth for the first earth and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as, from God as a, a bride prepared for, for her husband. And I'm thinking, you know, again, you know, at 67, I feel the pains of death working in my body. It, 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 at 67, you start to feel it. You know, I used to be a big, strong guy. But at my age, you start to feel all that, you know, the, 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 the functions of death. And I just read the scripture, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? You know, and I want to raise my children here. The, the, in the millennial kingdom, Satan is going to be bound. The demons will be bound. Yeah. You know, peace will reign. They're going to take all the aircraft carriers, all the F-20, uh, 35s, all the, all that. And they're going to take all that metal and they're going to beat it into implements of peace. And I want to raise my children here. I yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, and you know what, Robert, and I know that you've spent a lot of times overseas too, uh, uh, similar to me, mm -hmm. spent a lot of time overseas and in professional capacities and then just in, in serving in ministerial capacities. And I say this unequivocally, the only Christians on the face of the earth that would be so narcissistic as to say they don't want Christ to come back are the American Christians. You would never, ever catch another believer in any other country of the world uttering those words. Well, I just want to see my kids grow up. Oh, I just want to see my grandkids graduate college. Oh, I just want to be able to enjoy my retirement. I've worked so hard and I've been really looking forward to retirement. I don't want Jesus to come back. The it's it's very unique to the mystery Babylonian posture of the apostate church, which is contained within the United States of America. It's the it's the th theology of positive, encouraging K-love, right? Which if people don't understand, that singular entity is a theology. It is a doctrine and it has led the masses astray, the masses. And then like, and, and that is the overarching theme of the majority of the believers in America is this, is this love of self. Remember it says, again, 2 Timothy 3, that they will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God rather than and and they will be lovers of self they will be proud boastful arrogant treacherous rash conceited abusive right disrespectful it's talking about the church those letters are written to the church it's not talking about the unbelieving world and it says they will actually do a cosmic usurpation a cosmic uh uh, uh what would it be like an exchange a cosmic exchange and they will choose pleasure they'll be lovers of pleasure rather than or more than lovers of god and therefore, they would say, like it says, in that day, there will be false prophets, false teachers leading many astray, saying, where is this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Every day goes on business as usual. The prophets are nothing but wind. And it says, with, they will fabricate stories and exploit you, greedy for unjust gain. They will exploit you and deny the return of Christ Jesus to make you be lovers of the world. Because see, this is the nature of the warfare, of the cosmic warfare. The enemy doesn't have to get you to be a God hater. Everybody tracking? Satan does not have to get you to be a God hater, to shake your fist at the heavens and to curse God. He doesn't have to get you to do that. All he has to do is make you love the world and the things of the world. Because it says anybody who loves the world is at enmity with God. And the love enmity. of the Father is not in them. And the love, yeah. And enmity means bitter rancor, forcible hatred, or warfare. So all the enemy has to do is make you really like the pleasantries of this life. That's all he has to do to make you an enemy of God. And by what, by the way, a unique qualifier about that word enmity, I just studied it out here a little while ago for a for a sermon, but the unique qualifier of the word enmity, which I'd never knew before, is that it's a mutual exchange of hatred. So it's not that you're at enmity with God. He is also at enmity with you. Do you imagine being on the receiving end of the forcible hatred, bitter rancor, and warfare of the Most High God? As you're using his name, you're actually an enemy of God and he's an enemy of you? I mean, what a woeful thing, but yeah, it is central. And, and that's why... It's so critical for the believers in this hour to authentically examine their hearts. Where you're falling short, praise God, he's so merciful to reveal that to you. Repent. He's faithful and just to heal you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You know, like turn your laughter into, into sorrow and weep and mail and mourn. And, and mourn. And at the appointed time, he'll lift you back up on your feet where you've been a lover of the world rather than a lover of a, of the God who bought you through his son, Jesus Christ, where you have falsely placed your hope on these things of this world as if they're going to satisfy you, where you have been a reprobate, where you've been an enemy of God and you've been an enmity, where you've treated him as with indifference, which is the highest form of hatred, by the way, the highest form of hatred is indifference. Like hatred itself is not bad. God hates all kinds of things and God has love. Indifference is the opposite of love. There is nothing more unloving than be apathetic, complacent, or indifferent to any to anything. So where you've been indifferent or complacent or apathetic, repent. The Lord, like how merciful the Lord to reveal it to us now willingly rather than later on desperately and come back in 
to renewed lenses. Go to the true and better optometrist, Jesus Christ, who has the healing balm of Gilead that literally falls on you to come to him and to apply it to your eyes so that you might rightly see and then allow him to restore you with the right heart and the right perspective with such a laser focus for the hope of glory secure for you in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you would look at the world around you and be like, eh, not even worth comparing to the joy that I'm going to get to experience. Light momentary afflictions. Don't care. I'll forsake everything for Christ. I know what's coming for me and I can endure all these things for the joy set before me. I ask you this question so people can again examine themselves because I think, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to say something, you know, with great specificity, uh, Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks predicted the first coming of Jesus. I mean, it was, it was greatly specific. And and yet, you know, throughout the scripture, Jesus gives a sign over and over and over again. And I'm not I'm not a date setter, so I'm not saying, it's, you know, next week, next year, whatever. But with great specificity, he talked about the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. I, the, the, the one world currency, we see at the great reset, the one world religion. All, all those signs, we see him coming to pass, his birth pangs, bang, 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 bang. My daughter-in-law just had a baby. And, and I just, I, I, as she was going through this contraction pain, I was just thinking of the, the biblical signs and, the, and how they refer, refer to it. Um, but <clears throat> so my, my, my question is, uh, getting to it in a roundabout way, how does God retool a person's mind? You know, because again, we used to think like the world. I love the things of the world. Oh, wow. You know, my phone, I, I, I can't do without it. My, my stuff. I can't do without it. And and what are the practical steps a person uses to have God retool them so they become not just a dull chisel, not just a rusted old saw, but a, a, an instrument that's a tool used and fit for the master to take and to create and use for his kingdom? How does God do that in a, in a person's life? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, and I do think that it's it's... It has to begin. It has to begin with counting the cost. That's the command Jesus gave: is count the cost. So count the cost of going all in for the Lord. And whether most believers realize it or not, they've counted the cost of being all in for the Lord, and they found it to be too high. They don't even know that they made that intellectual agreement, but Life they found it to virgins. be too high. But for those, yeah, but for those who have <laughs> counted the cost and they're all in for the Lord. What would be manifest is an undone, unrestrained faith. They would actually walk by faith and not by sight. They would be like Abraham, who who um, when the Lord commanded him to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance. He obeyed and went, even though he had no clue where he was going. And it was accredited to him as righteousness. They would say, Lord, I'm willing. Take me to zero. And then you actually follow Lord to zero on the bank account. Lord, I'll liquidate my whole life for you. Whether you required of me or not, I've, I'm willing, God, I've tested my heart. To, I'm willing to liquidate my entire reality. Lord, I'm willing to, to forsake my reprobate adult children who hate you, God, instead of compromising your word and your truth and your love so I can retain some fleeting, faulty, you know, sense of family loyalty. Uh, and, and yet you told me if I'm not willing to forsake everything for you, God, I can't be your disciple. And so the Lord says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. I did a sermon on this uh, a little while back. People can, can go look at it. It says, it was, I titled it Mission Impossible because it literally says it is impossible to please the Lord without faith. And I think by faith, you would follow the Lord wherever he leads. By faith, you would love. By faith, you would die to the flesh that you think is going to satisfy you. By th faith, you would surrender your anxieties and your fears and the dissipations of this life. By faith, you would pursue the heart of one who is far from God. By faith, you would do it. By faith, you would stand when he tells you to stand. By faith, you would sit when he tells you to sit. By faith, you could be entrusted with much. And by faith, you would be content and having nothing. You would do it all by faith. And the Lord would say, now watch what I'll do with your life. You know, yeah, got a so question. I think that that is, that is the big indicator. So i got a question for you. We all know the story of Lot. You know, he went into Sodom with great wealth. In fact, the land could not contain the wealth of both Abraham and Lot. So he went into Sodom with great wealth. What did he leave with? Um, pretty much all his wealth was gone. He lost his wife. 
and his yeah, daughters. Yeah, not even his wife. Yeah, and his daughters yep. were definitely corrupted by the immorality they saw. You know, but here's the yep. redemptive question I want to ask you, Jamie. You know, and this is where I think a lot of people are at. They find themselves in Sodom. They're there. And, it, 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 and let's be honest, Sodom has pleasure. But in the end, it strips you of everything that is good, what you do. But what would have happened, do you think, and this is a little conjecture on your part, what would have happened if a year before those angels came to Sodom, Lot had come to his senses and said, you know, Mrs. Lot, I have brought our family into evil, and God has convicted me, and we are going to take our substance, what we have left, and I'm going to go back to my uncle, and I'm going to confess that I should not have come down here, and I'm going to repent and ask him for help. What do you think would have happened a lot at that point? Oh, my goodness. I mean, we would be reading a whole different story that context of Lot's life, you know, and I think about that so much in, in our own reality. Actually, you asking that makes me think of Mordecai's admonishment to Esther, you know, where he's like, and I love, again, the American Christianese is so, so narcissistic. You're always like, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, you know, they use that as a, as a little emotional heartstring thing. And I go, that was not, he was not edifying Esther. He was admonishing her. And he said, listen, <laughs> Esther, Queen Esther, if you remain silent at this time, deliverance for God's people will come through somebody else, but you and your house will suffer for it. But how do you know that you haven't come to this royal position for such a time as this? You know, and I think like, how do you know, like, if you go all in for the Lord, coming back to that faith question and counting the costs, you have no clue what the Lord would want to do. But the consequences of remaining silent, the consequences of clinging to the world or the things of the world, the consequences of letting fear rule your life, fear of your finances, fear of relational validation. It's usually always about validation. I'm insecure. I'm a victim. I'm insecure. I'm a victim. I'm insecure. I'm a victim. I'm prideful. I'm arrogant. I'm whatever. It's all centered on a love of self, right? To really die to all that and walk by faith, you have no clue what the Lord will do with your life. Yeah, like, how could you know? But I'll tell you what, if you choose to remain silent this time, if you choose to remain in Sodom and to remain in Gomorrah because you like the vanity fair that's all around you, and yet you just sprinkle a little Jesus Christian ear on why you're doing what you're doing, well, I feel called to do this. I feel called. Every time I hear I feel called, I'm like, I, I instantly get a check in my spirit, right? But if you choose to remain in Vanity Fair now, don't worry. Deliverance for God's people, he'll it'll come through somebody else. He he has made promises and they're immovable and they're eternal. He he's he's given us uh, his word to stand on. He's told us the spirit that he's called to live with, live within us. He's told us that there will be those who are strong in the Lord and go forth and do daring feats of exploits. He said there will be those who are wise in the Lord who tim turn many back to righteousness. He's given us the distinction of the sheep and the goat and the wheat and the tares and the, and the five foolish virgins and the five virgins, uh, five wise versions. He's told us the distinction of those who are overcome versus those who are among the overcomers, right? Even overcoming the entire B system. He's given us the distinctions. So now we get to choose to be Lot or Abraham. We get to choose, like you can choose to remain in Sodom and Gomorrah. You can choose to remain blind, deaf, dumb, and have your senses dulled at Vanity Fair or like Abraham, you can follow the Lord wherever he leads you, not even knowing where you're going by faith and watch what he'll do with you. you know, again, <clears throat> I just think of that. I've pondered that question many times. If Lot had come to his senses, you know, and there are many people that are in Sodom, they're in Gomorrah, and they're enjoying it. I mean, again, it does have temporal pleasure. There's temporal pleasure of sin. Yeah, and let, let me add to this, Robert. I think about, too, I think about how many people— we're waiting in Jerusalem for the promised hope outpouring of the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. And they got weary from waiting and they left because they needed to go work. They needed to earn money. They can't sit around waiting on the Lord forever, right? All their logic, all their humanistic logic comes in. And I wonder how many didn't 
wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and they left prematurely. I also think how many didn't put blood over their door when they were in the land of Goshen? How many said, that's ridiculous. Who is this Moses guy? He's an Egyptian anyways. What does God care? We haven't heard from him in 400 years. And now this guy who is an Egyptian, but he's not, but he's a Hebrew, but he's not. And he's been gone for 40 years and he's coming back, stirring up all these problems with us. Now we got to make bricks without straw. And he's telling us to put the blood of a lamb over our door, whatever. And eat right? bitter and herbs. Go, How many didn't? Yeah. How many didn't do that? How many didn't wait wait for the Holy Spirit because of the dissipations of this life? It says, do not be overcome by the anxieties, anxieties, hello, and dissipations of this life so that that day, the day of the Lord would come upon you while you're unaware. And so it's I'm like... Again, coming back to that eager anticipation, that waiting, that longing, that heart's desired for your bridegroom to be betrothed to the one you love, to have that consummation of the marriage covenant once and for all time, the two becoming one flesh, never to be ripped apart. Like, why aren't we living that way? It yep. changes everything. It, the it, it, object it, it, of absolutely. your hope determines the, the, the way you navigate. The object of your hope determines every hope in the world, hope in your spouse, hope in your kids, hope in your money, hope in your finances, hope in Trump getting elected again, whatever your fault, hope in your church, hope in your crummy pastor who's just a carnal man too, just trying to sojourn as well. Anything that you have your hope in apart from Christ is going to fail you with devastating consequences. That when your hope is in the true and better object, Christ Jesus himself, man, would you live differently? You know, you would live so radically different. That's that's the thing. I just I just want to tell people that are find themselves in Sodom and you and you find yourselves trapped into that lifestyle. Come out, the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. I just imagine, you know, Lot doing just that. He left a year early and he came out. Mrs. Lot would be alive. He would have preserved his wife. He would have yes. preserved his wife. His, his daughters would have married. They wouldn't have had to commit incest to have children. He, they would have yes. probably found good men to marry um, in within their own family. So Mrs. Lot would then have had grandchildren. And that whole promise of God towards the family, you know, would have been fulfilled in Lot's life versus leaving Sodom, seeing your wife die, seeing your children corrupted seeing all that God has given you stripped away from you and you're living miserable in some barren cave somewhere. That's, that is your goal. If the Lord Jesus Christ is not your passion, you're going to find yourself one day in some barren, you know, cave somewhere separated, feeling apart from God. And all it takes, all it takes is for you to say, I'm leaving Sodom. Lord, give me the grace for this sojourn. I'm going to come out. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to repent of what I've been doing. And I and, and God's blessing then comes upon your life. You know, the, the, the virgins, there was a unique thing about them. They all were asleep when the master came. You know, yeah, there, was, that's true. there was a certain, a certain slumber that had overtaken them all. But because the five wise ones had prepared for that day, the five wise ones knew they were going to hear the call of the bride. The five foolish ones, I don't think they believed it. They had prepared, they had, they had prepared their life for the change that was coming when their bridegroom showed up. And that's the passion that I want to impart to people that you you need to seek this from the Lord, that to have that passion. So whether awake or asleep, wherever you find yourself, there's this burning passion. My bride is coming. He is going to betroth me. We're going to go off into his the the place that he has prepared. Behold, you know, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And versus those that are in Sodom. That aren't that have not allowed the Holy Spirit to retool their life to become fit for the master's use, to become a tool fit for the master's use, that don't get invited into the, the wedding supper. And so, Jamie, I know we're coming up on time. Uh, why don't you why don't you close that? Because I, I want to finish one more question. Why aren't the pastors? I mean, here you and I, you're a little bit more not of a layman than I am. I'm a layman. <clears throat> and yet I love talking about this. 
I know you do love talking about it. Why why don't our America's pastors love talking about this? Yeah, that's that's a good question. You know, for those that don't know, I I I am a pastor. I do pastor a church and and the Lord called me into it specifically. I have no I had no desire to be one, but it was because of the failings of the pastors. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, look at all the times God speaks woe, and it's woe to the shepherds, woe to the priest, woe to the prophets, woe to the leaders, you know, and he says, surely these are only the poor and the ignorant. I'll go to the leaders. Surely they'll know the way of the Lord, and they will they will say, come let us fear the Lord, but with one accord, they too threw off the yoke of the Lord, you know, and, it, and the reason why the, the pastors will not touch the fear of the Lord with the 10-foot pole. I have family members that are full-time megachurch pastors that literally ask me, what is the fear of the Lord? They're pastors, and they've, they said, I've never heard anybody even mention the fear of the Lord. Pastors for 35 years have no concept of the fear of the Lord. They're asking me what it even means. And, and the, the bottom line is the reason why they will never speak to these things is because they love the world and the things of the world. They don't want the esteem of God. It says, this is a man who I esteem, him who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. They would never tremble at the word. They would be repulsed by the idea of fearing the Lord. They would be repulsed by the idea of dying to self. They would be repulsed by the idea of hatred. By the way, God hates all kinds of things. They would be repulsed by the idea of despising somebody else, a vile man. Why? Because they want the validation from all those people. They want the validation from the world. They want the validation in their bank accounts. They mm -hmm. want their validation from every reprobate that steps foot into their presence. They want the validation of their children that hate God. They're open God haters. They want the esteem of men and they have no regard for the esteem of the Lord. They truly in their heart of hearts, love, love, love the world and all the things that come with the world. That's why they will never speak about these things. They won't because it would be self-condemning. They would be self-immolating. So they'll never speak to it. You know, I, I think in the book of Revelation, the last prayer of the Bible, John didn't say, I love you, Jesus, even though he did. John didn't have some spectacular thing to say. John's last words in the book of Revelation, the last prayer was, even so, come, Lord Jesus. He had that passion in his heart. He wanted to see his master come. He had seen the glorified Christ. He saw the, the lamb sitting on the throne with the emerald, just the rainbow, of the beauty of it all. Do you, Jamie, I'm going to ask this question. I mean, not to you, but everybody do you see that do you see the lamb sitting on the throne do you see the lamb magnified do you see the lamb the creator of all things do you see the lamb that the angels before the throne day and night without ceasing holy 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 art thou lord god almighty just and true are thy ways thou king of saints who will not fear thee Jamie, I, I've, I've so enjoyed having you here. I feel every time we get together, we're two brothers walking down the Emmaus Road and Jesus shows up. Um, yeah. I, I'm yeah ask it, it. It's simple. Yeah, there's no, no big mystery to it, but it's like, just seek the Lord's face while it, it may be found. That's always it is like, just pursue the Lord. You know, it's like the ask, seek, knock thing, you know? And and if if you search for wisdom, if you search for it as for, you know, as for a uh, uh, silver or for precious treasure, if you look for it, you will find it. It's so simple. The Lord's promises are so simple that any child could understand it. And yet the woke progressive, you know, self-proclaimed, you know, astute Christian has no idea how to find the way of the Lord or the path of the Lord. They have no idea. They choose the wide one. The wide one's super easy, and many, many, many are on it. But they don't want the way of the few, because the way of the few means you can't be validated. Can't be validated. You'll never be validated on the path of the few. You can't enjoy your flesh. At least you can't, you know, continually enjoy your flesh. You have to mortify the flesh. You have to make, you have to 
put that ring in your ear signifying slavery, that, that's a repugnant word. You know, I've become a bond slave. Who wants, you know, it, it, unless you have the vision of the loving Lord Jesus Christ, of the, the glorified Lord Jesus Christ, who wants to put that ring in their ear to show that I'm a slave? It, it's, un, it's unpopular. And yet once you do that and you really commit your way to the Lord, the, the joy, the peace, everything that God brings in your life, that you walk through this world, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, you just think of that. The kings of the world today, their lives are in turmoil. The Hollywood starlets, their lives are in turmoil. Politicians' lives are in turmoil. Just the general public lives are in turmoil. But when you walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, when you dwell in his presence, you sit there and have that, that, have that spiritual, I'm at rest, I'm at peace, you know? All this does not discombobulate me because I see the King of Kings. I see the Lord of Lords. Jamie, I'm going to ask you to close and I'm going to ask you to pray. Um, any closing words and then uh, just pray that God uses this message to uh, touch his people and to draw those that hear his voice back to him and to those who love him, greater, a greater passion, you know, add more oxygen to the fire so that it burns yeah, brighter. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I think um, in closing, I just think of Luke 21, you know, it, he lays out, Christ lays out for us, Luke 21, Matthew 24, Mark 13, right? Lays out for us the signs of the times, and it talks about the consternation the, in the distress, the consternation, the distress, the perplexities, the distress, right? Your heart being so in distress, so hopeless, that men's hearts will fail them physiologically. Actually, in the survival world, it's called psychogenic death. Your mind is so hopeless that it actually causes you to die. That's a real thing. It's called psychogenic death, right? And But in Luke 21, as Christ lays out the litany of the expectation of the hopelessness of the unbelieving world, he ends with this. He says, but when you, those who know him, those who hope, whose hope is in him and in the resurrection, who hold unswervingly to the hope that they profess, it says, but for you, when you begin to see all these things taking place, you stand up and look up because your redemption draws nigh. See, we're not of those who mourn as if we have no hope. We know the resurrection. And so as we see these things taking place, we should be standing up and looking up in eager anticipation because we know our redemption draws nigh. That is the appropriate posture of the warrior redeemed of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I do just thank you and praise you, God, for the opportunity to gather with my my brother Robert, Lord, and I just thank you for the for the camaraderie, Lord, the the rich brotherly love that we've been able to enjoy over the years, Lord, and sharing things with our families, God, and watching them grow and learn together, and and enjoying our spouses together, God, and and I know that this isn't even some big altruistic thing going on here. It's just two brothers fellowshipping before you. And just calling to remembrance the amazing grace that we've been bought into, Lord. And I know Robert and I would never say that we have it figured out or that we've arrived, but man, do we want to preach the truth of the gospel over ourselves every single day until our hearts actually believe it and sing for it, God, and run towards it and pursue it, God, and hunger and thirst for more of you in our lives. And that's all we could ever desire, Lord, is more of you and more of your presence. God, let the unbelieving world have their allotment in their life, like the tribes of, of Israel. Let them have their allotment of land and their spoils of the temporal things of the flesh. But Lord, you've told us that we are a royal priesthood. And as such, our allotment, like the allotment of the Levites, is your very presence, God. We know nothing else will satisfy. We don't want the house and the cars and the comfort and the retirements and the 401ks and the IRAs and the esteem of men, God, we want you and we want your presence alone. And that is the only allotment that will ever satisfy. So God, have your way in us, Lord. And I pray that whoever might hear this, those with ears to hear, that you would um, just embed a blessing in it, Lord, and cut us to the heart uh, and make our hearts beat for you and cry out for you, God. And and make us a strong, resilient, bold, steadfast, resolute people who know the spirit that you've caused to dwell in us through your son, Christ Jesus, 
who know the hope of glory and the hope of the resurrection. And we have no fear of anything in this life. We are not shaken, God. We have no fear of bad news and our hearts are steadfast trusting in you. So we love you, God, and we thank you for this time. And I pray all these things in the powerful, life-giving name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. And even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.